So what are degrees of freedom? The loose definition is the number of data points that have the freedom to take on any value. We theoretically withhold the data points necessary to ensure we can get to the overall values like mean averages. Estimating one population mean, for example, causes us to lose one degree of freedom, one data point. Suppose the population mean is 70 and we take a sample of size 9. Eight of the data points are free to be any number. By holding back one data point, one degree of freedom, we could add just the right ninth value to bring the overall mean to 70. You'll see it becomes more complicated with two sample means, but this gives you a basic understanding from which to work. Suppose we calculate a t-score of 1.74 for a sample mean. This implies the sample mean is 1.74 standard errors above the mean of the null. Would we reject the null at a 5% level of significance? Well, this depends when it comes to t-distributions. With small sample sizes and thus small degrees of freedom, this is not a statistically significant difference between the sample mean and the presumed mean of the null. Recall that t-distributions are more spread out for smaller samples due to the error introduced by having to use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. But this additional error is reduced with larger sample sizes, which tend to be more accurate. If our sample size was 18 and thus our degrees of freedom were 17, a test statistic of t equals 1.74 would now constitute a statistically significant result and we would reject the null. The purpose of me sharing this is to recognize that we want the most degrees of freedom possible. Two sample t-tests have three ways to calculate degrees of freedom. The first is a simple estimation rule. Use the degrees of freedom calculated by subtracting 1 from the smallest sample size. But see how, in our example, we would only end up with 8 degrees of freedom despite a combined sample size of 21, and our test statistic would not be significant in the standard t-distribution with 8 degrees of freedom. The second approach will give us twice as many degrees of freedom and allow us to reject the null. Here's the ugly formula that could be used, but not the fear, it's built into the calculator. Simply run the two-sample t-test, or interval, on the calculator, and it will report the degrees of freedom along with the other results. In our example, we may end up with more than 17 degrees of freedom, and this would cause us to reject the null. The third approach is referred to as pooling the variances. It yields the greatest degrees of freedom, but it's only allowed when we know that the two populations have equal variances, equal standard deviations. Since this is rarely the case, we rarely can pool. In fact, the calculator will ask if you want to pool, and its default answer is no. You'll see when we get there what I'm talking about. But if we can pool the variances, the degrees of freedom is the sum of the sample sizes minus 2. This would be 19 degrees of freedom, and again, 1.74 would be a significant test statistic.